careers in science, technology, engineering, and math are all about. So today, I am here with Dr. Ann Jefferson, an assistant professor of geology at Kent State University in Ohio, to talk about what she does in her job and why what she does rocks. You see what I did there? <laughs> Hi, Ann. Hi. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's an honor. <laughs> So, could you tell us a little bit about what your job is right now? So, as you said, I'm an assistant professor. Um, I'm in a geology department. So, my job consists of teaching college students about geology, but more specifically about water, because the type of science that I'm really interested in is the science of uh, water flowing in rivers and water flowing under the ground. Um, and I also do research on those topics. That's awesome. So what does that mean that you really do on a daily basis? Like, what is your job like? Um, well, technically, my job is half teaching and half research. But in reality, there's not a single pattern to my day. So it's more of these things are supposed to balance out over the course of a week or over the course of a month or over the course of a few months. Um, so teaching can be both in the classroom. So right now I'm teaching a whole class on rivers. Um, but it can also be working with undergraduate students and graduate students on research projects that they're interested in. And then my research can be working with the students and it can be doing things on my own. And research entails everything from going out in the field, so out to a stream and making measurements, taking samples, bringing them back to the lab, analyzing data uh, and maps on a computer, and then writing it all up and explaining what's going on. Cool. So what is it like to teach college students? What do you have to do when you prepare to teach a course on rivers, for example? Um, well, one of the things that's probably really different from elementary, middle school, and high school teaching is that, well, sometimes there's a textbook we can use. There's really very little prepared materials or even very much guidance in terms of what has to happen in the course. So if I'm teaching a class on rivers, my first job is to figure out what topics I think are important to include in that course. So, for instance, I think floods are really exciting. So I am going to make sure that there's a section in the course on what happens to rivers during floods and how do they change because of floods. And then once I've kind of started to think through the topics, then I have to go find a book that has hopefully most of those topics in it and is written at a level that's appropriate for the students. <coughs> and then... Um, and then I have to write the whole course from scratch. So I have to figure out what order I'm going to put the topics in, how much detail I'm going to cover each one, what assignments I'm going to put with each topic. Am I going to go for readings that are not just in the book, but are maybe on the web or in a journal article? Um, and then the most fun part about teaching about rivers, for instance, is that I get to take students outside the classroom to local streams and rivers and get them to actually make measurements and explore processes on their own. Oh. That's really fun. So do they do the students in your classes help you with your research a little bit? Um, not very often in the formal classwork, but sometimes they'll help me see a feature or a process in a different way, or they'll ask me a question that gets me thinking about what's going on, or sometimes they can collect really very preliminary data that we can then use to guide future research efforts. So, for example, a couple weeks ago, I took my class out to a stream that had been restored or basically reconstructed over the summer. And we'd worked on it for research prior to that reconstruction. And so my class was out there afterwards, and it was very different. And they made some measurements about the shape of the channel in various places along the reconstructed stream. Well, that data will then guide my graduate student who's working on that stream in terms of thinking about how he wants to collect data there um, and the sorts of measurements he's going to make in which places in the stream. That's really cool. So you said that this measurement that you guys did in a reconstructed stream is going to help your graduate student. What, are, what kind of projects are you currently doing in your research in terms of like what your grad student is doing and what you're doing? Um, so there's, there's kind of three things that I'm broadly interested in, and then 
within those three big themes, I'm sort of have a couple of projects that have much more narrow focus. So what broadly what I'm interested in is how water moves in rivers and under the ground, what we call groundwater. And I'm interested in how rivers and groundwater shape the landscapes, how they erode things and deposit things and really can transform a landscape over time. And then the third thing I'm interested in is how humans, intentionally or unintentionally, are transforming landscapes and affecting rivers and affecting groundwater and how all those three things kind of go into a blender and get mixed up. Um, so within those sort of broad interests, I'm looking at things, and my graduate students are looking at things like stream restoration. So the idea that we could take rivers or streams that have had some negative impacts because of, say, cities being built around them and try to improve their water quality or improve the habitat, the places where plants and animals can live in the stream, or simply reduce the flooding and the erosion of the stream banks. And we're trying to figure out how effective those practices really are and what maybe we can do in the future to be better at restoring streams. Um, another example of a project a student is working on is that um, when we build cities on the landscape, we really reduce the amount of water that can soak into the ground in most places because you know, if you spill a cup of water on a street, it doesn't go into the ground the same way as if you spilled it in a forest. Um, and so more water reaches the streams in city landscapes and that causes a lot more flooding and a lot more erosion and can bring in a lot more pollution. So now what, um, what city planners and water managers and concerned citizens are trying to do is find ways to put more water back into the ground um, through things like rain gardens and rain barrels um, and you know, not washing your car on the driveway. Um, so things like that. So there's a project up in Cleveland where um, Cleveland Metro Parks got money to put in a whole bunch of rain gardens up and down a couple of streets. And so my student and I are looking at the data collected from the storm sewers below those streets. So if it rains on the street, some of the water goes into the storm sewer network. And then hopefully some of it goes into the rain gardens. So we're looking at one street where there are no rain gardens and one street where there are rain gardens and trying to see how much of an effect those rain gardens are having on terms of the water that's getting into the storm sewers and ultimately down into the stream. So your research could really change how people end up behaving and how people end up using their water. That would be the long-term big goal. It certainly wouldn't be from any one science project or any one researcher alone, but hopefully we can add a little bit more information that helps people improve the way we design cities or the way we do stream restoration. And then other scientists can add another little bit of information, and eventually all of it would get translated into um, engineering practice and, and urban design. Cool. So. Um, now, now you told me a little bit about what you're doing with the actual research. Once you're done, say, comparing like one, stri one street that has rain bar barrels versus one that does not, what happens when you have the answers to those questions and the result of, those, of that research? What, what's the process after that? Um, well, I think there's two answers to that. One is that we never really have the answers to the questions. Usually if we have answered one question, we've created like five more. Um, so maybe now if we know how effective putting 20 rain barrels on a single street was, our question might become, okay, well, can we put enough rain barrels in a whole watershed and a whole drainage area to make a real difference in the stream? So it becomes sort of a... It's like building something out of Legos. You know, once you put one block on, then you've got space to put more on. Um, so that's one part of it. So science never really ends. The other part is that it's um, getting an answer, and, and me and my student knowing the answer doesn't change anything. So what we have to do is communicate our science to other scientists, and the way we do that is by writing articles and publishing them in scientific journals and going to conferences and talking about them. But in my field, we also have to talk to people like the regulators that are um, setting up the way we design streets or the way we manage stormwater. Um, and we have to talk to homeowners and we have to talk to all sorts of people that aren't just other scientists. So, for example, yesterday my students and I were at a conference called the National Non-Point Source Monitoring Conference.
Nations, which is a lot of big words, but it was basically people from all over the country, some scientists, some people who work for cities and states, and some people who work for companies, who are all very interested in figuring out how we can have less pollution getting into streams and groundwater, and sharing stories about the things that they were trying and how well they were working and how well maybe they weren't working, maybe lessons learned one way or the other. And so uh, talking to people in groups like that is a great way of making science actually translate into action. That's really cool. So I have to imagine that all of this does not happen for free. You don't just go out and, you know, <laughs> put in rain barrels for free. So where do you get the money to do your research and how do you get it? How much does your research cost? And, you know, where do you get that money and how do you go about getting the money to do your work? Uh, that is a tough question because, you're right, research doesn't happen for free. Um, and so one of the big parts of my job is asking for money to do the science. And it turns out that I have to ask for money and get a lot of answers no before I get an answer yes. Um, so some of the places that I can get money to do my science are things like the U.S. National Science Foundation, um, or the Environmental Protection Agency, but unfortunately there's a lot more science that needs to be done than there's money to fund it. So like I said, I get no for an answer an awful lot. Um, you would think with a really applied field like stream restoration and stormwater management that there would be more money around, but oftentimes um, that money is for doing things like buying the rain barrels and not necessarily for doing things like figuring out how effective the rain barrels actually are, the science end of it. So sometimes I have to sort of get creative and, and like for example this rain gardens project, we're sort of doing it for free Cleveland Metro Parks got the money to do the rain garden installations um, and they got it from the Environmental Protection Agency and we're kind of adding the science on there and in exchange my graduate student will get a job hopefully with Cleveland Metro Parks at least for next summer. So there's lots of little little bits of money that might be available um, but you know it's a continual challenge to try to get uh, projects done and some projects uh, require a lot of equipment in streams or in groundwater and those can be expensive but even projects where not a lot of equipment is required still requires time from people and so uh, supporting graduate students and undergraduate students uh, to do the research is uh, one of the things I'm always trying to find money to do. Yeah. It's good to be realistic. So can you tell me what a typical day is like for you when you're conducting research, you know, when you're actually out in the field or analyzing data. What is a day like for you doing that? Again, there's no typical day. There's sort of three types of days. There's the days entirely in front of a computer. There's the days that are mostly in the lab, and then there are the days that are in the field. And the field days are probably the most interesting, so I guess I'll tell you about those. Um, and I can tell you about some of the days that I spent in the summer in that stream that was being about to be restored and we were sort of frantically trying to collect data about the stream because we knew that in a matter of days or weeks bulldozers would arrive and start to really just not destroy the stream but completely recreate it. Um, so we would go out in the morning and um, in, in hip waders and uh, and we would do things like use survey equipment to try and get really good measurements of the channel shape. Or there was one whole day where we pounded um, about inch and a half PVC pipes into the bottom of the stream and those pipes had holes on them in the bottom and so they're what we call pisometers. But basically what they do is they tell us about water that's moving um, from the stream and into the stream bed. And so we'd pound these pipes into the ground and then we'd wait for them to kind of settle out and then we'd add more water to the top of the pipe and we'd watch how quickly it disappeared back out of the pipe. And that tells us how easily water is moving into those stream bed sediments. So um, if it's moving quickly... Then there's, a good, quickly there's potentially the a good connection between the stream and the groundwater. And if it's moving really slowly, there's not. And it okay. turns out that there's a lot of really cool biology and chemistry that happen in stream beds. Um, but they happen because of the mixing between the surface water, the stream water, and the groundwater. And so if, if 
it's really hard to get that mixing to happen because it's like lots of really tiny clay particles and silt particles, then you don't get as much um, biological diversity in there. You don't get um, as much of the biogeochemical processing, which is a fancy way of saying all the nutrients that living things need to live. There's a lot of fancy chemistry happening in the stream bed, so I'm trying to figure out the physical aspects of it that'll really be kind of the the big controls on the biogeochemistry and the biology that's happening there. Um, so yeah, pounding pipes into stream beds, <laughs> pouring water into those pipes, and then making careful measurements of how quickly things disappear. Um, and then we had a really long, fun day where we actually turned the stream purple. So we had a dye. Why? <laughs> we had a dye that we injected into the stream. So basically we had a big trash can full of very, very purple water. Um, and, and it's completely biologically harmless. Um, but what happens is that a lot of it just gets moved down in the stream water itself. But some of it moves, again, into the bottom of the stream and into the bed of the stream where all the cool biology and biogeochemistry is happening. And that, when it's moving through the stream bed, it's moving much more slowly. Um, and biology is happening down there. And this dye is super cool because when it is metabolized, basically when microbes use it, it goes from being a purple dye to being a pink dye. And so we can actually take bottles of water in various places in the stream and at various times when we're adding the purple dye and we can take them back to the lab and we can actually measure how much purple dye is in that water and how much pink dye is in that water. And so we can measure from that, we can sort of take it back to our computer then, so this is a multi-day process, take it back to our computer and figure out um, how much exchange there is between the stream bed and the stream water and how much metabolic activity or how much biology is really going on in the stream bed. So that was a super fun day scientifically. There was lots of energy going into hauling big tubs of water around and getting things set up. And then once we got the experiment going, I had um, five, four helpers sitting in various places along the stream basically reading a book most of the time, but every 20 minutes or so um, grabbing a bottle of water from the stream and, and saving it for laboratory use later. But the net result is that you really did turn a stream purple for science. We really did turn a stream purple for science, and it was, um, it was pretty <laughs> healthy purple. Because it was in a city park, and we tried to get going early in the morning, but it was still pretty purple by the time evening rolled around, and it was a nice summer day, and there was lots of <laughs> baseball fields. And uh, we definitely had some people wander by, and one of the, my um, assistants said, these two women were talking to each other, and they said, the stream looks really weird today. I wonder what's going on. So usually if I hear a comment like that, I try and give people sort of a quick explanation of the science we're doing. But that wasn't always possible. The kids were fascinated by the purple stream. So that was really fun. That's really cool. So can you tell me, you know, it sounds like you have a really awesome job. You get to turn streams purple for science. Um, but you also get to do a lot of teaching and stuff. How did you get to where you are now? Like, how did you get to your current job? You know, where did you start? What were your processes that, you know, made you develop your career the way you did? Okay. Um, so actually, I would credit a lot of my start in science to uh, science fairs because I started doing science fair projects in fifth grade, uh, like many kids do, but I kept on doing them through middle school and high school. And in that process, I discovered that I really liked rivers. Um, so my first science fair project was on dishwashing and the chemistry of dishwashing. And that taught me two things. I didn't like dishwashing, and I was not that into chemistry. You had to be taught that you didn't enjoy dishwashing. I think it was my mom's excuse to get me to do dishwashing. <laughs> um, and then I did one on snow, which was pretty cool. And then I started working on rocks. And rocks were pretty, they were even cooler than snow. 
But, you know, they don't really change very fast. And I grew up in the middle of North America where the rocks are really old. They don't even have very exciting fossils in them. Um, but I also grew up right on the Mississippi River. And I grew up um, in a town on the Mississippi River during some big floods. And so uh, one year when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with rocks for a science fair project, th these big floods were going on. And so we couldn't get to the rocks we wanted to get to on the banks of the river. So I ended up working on the river itself instead. And, and then I was basically hooked because um, here was something that was changing all the time. It was really important to my community. Um, you know, people, lots of people would like to go out and fish and boat on the river, but also there was a lot of our economy was tied to the river, and so these floods were affecting people, and, and the sediment that was moving through the river was changing where the fishing holes were, or how easily the boats could move up and down river, and it was just, compared to the rocks that were sitting there and not really changing for hundreds of millions of years, the river was super exciting. Um, and so I started doing science fair projects on the Mississippi River. And I actually got to go to ISAF, the International Science and Engineering Fair, for three years in high school um, when I was a sophomore, junior, and senior. And I got to tell people about the science I was doing on the Mississippi. And, and to share that enthusiasm and to get other students and adult scientists who um, ask me questions and say that what I was doing was interesting was a really... Um, positive reinforcement. It kind of made the time worth it. Plus I got to go to cities all over the country and even all over the world to do this and I got to meet lots of other uh, geeky but wonderful friendly people, kids my age, you know, that were also doing projects on science that interested them and so knowing that I wasn't the only person out there who was interested in science was just a huge motivator. It's like I found my community through science fairs and so I went off to college um, to Johns Hopkins and I knew that I wanted to do something with water um, and so I majored in geology and uh, then I went and I got a master's degree in water resources science from the University of Minnesota and um, and then I got a PhD in geology from Oregon State. And I spent one year after my PhD doing research in a position that's called a postdoc, which is sort of a temporary position. And then I was hired to my first professor job. And I've been a professor now for about seven years. So that was sort of the path that I took. That's really cool. So you got into this because of a, a love of rivers and of science and stuff. So. Um, what really do you, like, what, what is one of the things that you really, really love about your job? I really like being able to find answers to questions and be the first person to know something. Um, whether it's just being the first person to know, like, how easily water moves through that particular piece of the stream bed, or whether it's being the first person to kind of connect all those pieces of data and say, look, this is how stream restoration affects the way water moves through the stream bed, so maybe we should think about this. Um, so being the first person to see the data and kind of put the puzzle pieces together and make sense of things is really exciting. And as someone who's a professor who has a PhD, I get to choose what questions I spend my time collecting data for. And so, um, so I can go down routes that are interesting to me, and they're not even necessarily things that I would have thought five or ten years ago I would be working on. So when I was a PhD student, I worked in beautiful mountain wilderness areas. And I didn't work on streams that were really tangibly affected by humans in any way. And then um, I moved to North Carolina and I started looking around this big city I was living in and I realized that most people didn't get to experience rivers in wilderness areas. Most people were seeing a creek flowing through their housing development. Or maybe they weren't seeing a creek at all because it had been put in a pipe underground. And so I started working in more urban and human affected systems. But that was a decision that I got to make. I started to say, hey, you know what, this is an important question, I think. 
I could take some of the skills that I have and start to ask some more questions about it and let me and then my whole research has kind of gone that way. So being the first person to discover something and being able to choose what questions I get to ask is probably the most fun and exciting part of the job for me. Well, that's really cool. It means that you can really pursue questions that are very important to you, but also very important to people, like how we deal with our water, how we see our water, what we do with it, right. that sort of thing. So um, we've talked about what you love about your job, and it's really, really cool. What's the most frustrating? Is there something really frustrating about your job? Um, there's, there's two things. The first is that, yes, I get to choose my own questions, um, but I can't always get the money to do the science that I want to do. So sometimes I will put a lot of myself, a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, a lot of my heart into a proposal and not get funded. And then I kind of have to regroup and try a different angle or sometimes, you know, kind of give up on that entirely, at least for a while, and go off and do something else. Um, so that's really hard because you get really invested in the questions you want to ask and you can't always do them. Um, the other part is that there's science never sleeps um, and neither does teaching and so everything is kind of constantly going and so sometimes it just feels like there's too many balls in the air or just too much going on to really keep up with um, and so trying to figure out how to manage my time efficiently but also how to say no when I need to say no have been some of the bigger challenges that I've been dealing with and will continue to deal with indefinitely. But it does sound like it's it's pretty well worth it that you get to do all the science that's important to you if, if you get the funding to do it anyway. Right. Yeah. No, I love my job. It's the perfect job for me. Awesome. So do you have any advice for people who might be interested in doing what you do for a living? Yeah. First of all, make sure it's what you want to do. So the best way to find that out is to get some experience, whether that's doing a science fair project as a middle school or high school or, or getting an internship when you're in college or even in high school. Um, so trying to figure out whether it's really what fits you. And then um, in, in all of the sciences, you need to be comfortable with math. Um, and, with, and in my field, you need to also be comfortable with chemistry and physics. Um, so even though I know I want to focus on rivers, and I've known I wanted to focus on rivers since I was in ninth grade, I had to take a lot of math and a lot of chemistry and a lot of physics and some biology along the way as sort of the complementary skills to the ones that I was really trying to build. So I would say... Um, you know, not shying away from things, even if they're hard at first. I used to think that I really didn't like math. And then eventually I realized, you know what, if I just work at it hard enough, I will get it. And, and once I could see how it applied to the things I was interested in, I just gained a lot more comfort and confidence with it. Um, so not giving up as you go along. So getting the, all the sciences together and seeing how they fit together, and then just persistence. Awesome. And it's true, the more you practice, you know, math, chemistry, stuff like that, the more you see how it applies to what you want to do. And the easier it gets because it gets more interesting. Okay, so the last question I have for you, you have dyed a stream purple for science. Is that the weirdest thing you have done for science? What's the weirdest thing that you have done in the name of science? Um, well, you know, dyeing a stream purple was pretty weird. Um, <laughs> It's funny because I just think of like this is what I do for science, this is what I do for my job, and so I stop things that other people would probably say were really weird. I don't think of as weird anymore. Um, but one thing that sort of continually cracks me up is when I go to the grocery store to get my family's groceries, but I also do things like buy 50 aluminum pie pans so that I can bring them to my lab and take cores of soil and open them up and dry them up on the pie pans or like searching and searching and searching for exactly the right size Tupperware container to store a syringe in so that it's like under the perfect amount of water. <laughs> you know, my shopping carts are sometimes very random but um, last you year... You know Tupperware is a great thing for syringes. Tupperware is very excellent. <laughs> It, a jelly roll pan turned out to be just what I needed. Um, 
But last year there was a space of about a week where I was um, ordering stuff for my lab uh, to use as internal lab standards. So, so samples that we'll measure over and over and over again and we'll compare our other results to. And so I measure water and I needed water from a really hot place and from a really cold place. Um, so I ended up buying two cases of bottled water. Um, one from a high elevation uh, site in Colorado and one from Hawaii. So I had to basically justify spending $40 on bo fancy bottles of water from Hawaii. <laughs> that and you can't drink. Yeah, that, I, that I've actually never tasted. Um, <laughs> And then once those bottles of water arrived, I had to, I couldn't just store them in plastic bottles because they might evaporate and that would throw off what I'm trying to measure. And so I needed uh, really good containers to pour all the bottles of water into. And it turns out that the type of containers I needed were beer kegs. Um, so in the space of a week, I ordered $40 worth of bottled water and three beer kegs. <laughs> so did you, did you justify that the beer kegs were for science? They were for science, and we had to specially modify them so that we could do exactly what we wanted to do with them. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so thank you so much for participating in You're this welcome. Google Hangout. I'm very excited to be able to post this on Eureka Lab. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you inspire lots of people to go look at their rivers in a new way. Thanks for having me.